This is the first Greek lesson. We'll start out with a basic discussion of what Greek verbs are and how they differ from English verbs. The main point of distinction between English and Greek language in regard to verbs is that the verbs conjugate much more noticeably than English verbs do. English verbs, for example, if you look at the word speaks, you would conjugate it as follows. You could say, I speak, you speak, he, she, or it speaks, we speak, you all speak, and then finally, they speak. I've conjugated this English verb, and yet there are almost no differences. The only difference is the third person singular speaks. It has an S on the end of it. For the first person singular, the second person singular, the first person plural, the second person plural, and the third person plural, there is no distinction in the conjugation of this English verb. Now look at the difference if I were to do the same thing with a Greek verb. The same verb, speak. It starts out as lego. The second person singular is leges. Third person singular is lege. Then legomen. Legata. Finally, legacy. I put a new in parentheses at the end of this because if it were followed by a vowel, it would need the N. If it were followed by a consonant, it would not need the N. That's called a new movable. At any rate, you can see as I conjugate the, la uh, the Greek verb, it's spelled drastically different in every single form. Whereas the English translation barely conjugates at all. As I just pointed out, almost all the forms are the same except for the third person singular. Whereas in Greek, every single form has a different ending. These endings are called the suffixes, and they indicate the person and number of the verb. The person and number of the verb. The person and the order in which these are presented is always first person and singular. The person is first, the number is singular. And then second person, singular. Third person, singular. First person plural, second person plural, third person plural. That is the normal way and the consistent way that we will always present the conjugation of verbs. Conjugation of verbs refers to the way that you change their ending in English or Greek when you change their person and number. First person singular, second person singular, third person singular. First person plural, second person plural, third person plural. Each of these is translated differently. The first one is, I speak. The second one is, you speak. Legace. The third one is, he, she, or it speaks. The fourth one is, we speak. The fifth one is, you plural, or you all speak. And the last one is, they speak. I'm illustrating for you is the conjugation of verbs in Greek. Specifically, what I've shown you is that verbs have a person and number that is indicated by a suffix. A suffix goes on to the end of the stem of a verb. 
For example, I showed you leg go, leg gaze, leg gay. This is the first person singular, this is the second person singular, and this is the third person singular. Each of these has a different suffix at the end of the verb, and each of these has the same stem. The suffix indicates which person and which number. The, possible, the possibilities are first person singular, second person singular, or third person singular, and then first person plural, second person plural, or third person plural. So the person refers to one, first, second, or third, and the number refers to singular or plural. So you can mix and match these in any way. First person singular, second person singular, third person singular, or first person plural, second person plural, and third person plural. To translate those into English, first person singular is I, second person singular is you, third person singular is he, she, or it, first person plural is we, second person plural is you all, and third person plural is they. So that's point number one. Be sure to stop this recording when you need to take notes and review. The main thing that you've learned so far is that verbs have different suffixes that indicate which person is doing the action. Depending on what ending you add to a verb, it indicates that a different person is doing the action. For example, lege could be he speaks, can also be she speaks or it speaks, whereas lego can only mean I speak. Depending on the ending, the person and number is different depending on the suffix. The situation is very similar for nouns. Nouns also have very specific endings that indicate how they function in a sentence. English has this as well, but again, English is much more simple. In English, you have the word, for example, they, and that uh, word is pronounced different than them. They're both the same stem, but they is the subject of the sentence, and them is the direct object of the sentence. In other words, they, as a word, does the action because it's the subject, whereas them receives the action because it's the direct object. Here's an example. You can say, they find the girl. They, in English, has an ending of Y to indicate that it is doing the finding. It is doing the action. On the other hand, if you used them, you could never say them find the girl. It's the wrong ending. You could, however, say that I see them. In this case, them, with an M on the end of it, indicates that it's receiving the action. Whom do you see? them. It receives the seeing. Who does the seeing? The subject, I. Here's another example in English. Who sees her? In this sentence, who is the subject? It does the seeing. However, I could also write a sentence that says, I see whom. In this case, whom is receiving the action, not doing the action. In the second sentence, I does the seeing, and whom gets seen, whom receives the action. Note that who 
is spelled differently than whom. Because again, who is the subject of the sentence, and whom is the direct object of the sentence. English generally, however, does not add endings onto nouns. That's why Greek is particularly difficult. You'll notice that Greek does not, uh, sorry, that English does not add endings the same way that Greek does. English adds a few endings, like I just showed you, who and whom, they and them. But generally speaking, English adds far less endings than Greek does. Main endings that the Greek language adds are as follows. These are the endings for nouns. Greek adds a nominative ending in the singular. It adds a gendive ending in the singular, a dative ending in the singular, an accusative ending to a noun in the singular, an evocative ending to a noun in the singular. Greek also adds a nominative ending in the plural, a genitive plural, a dative plural, an accusative plural, and a vocative plural. These endings will always be presented in this order. Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, vocative. Singular will always come first, followed by the plural. You won't be expected to add, um, memorize or understand all of these endings at once or at the same time, but in a pretty short amount of time, you will be responsible for understanding the different endings that are added to every noun, and you'll learn soon enough that this is also what you add to definite articles and to adjectives. So here's an example of how a Greek noun works with those endings. Just like a verb, you have a stem, and you have an ending. The common denominator in this word is the alpha, gamma, rho. Really, it goes all the way up to an Omicron sound, but it's difficult to explain that in a first lesson. The point is that you have a stem, and you have an ending that you add onto these nouns. Same thing as a verb. You have a stem and a suffix. The suffixes are circled in red. The names for each of these endings are as follows. The first one is the nominative singular. The second one is the genitive singular. Dative singular accusative singular. I'm skipping the vocative because the vocative is not really a priority. Then you go to the nominative plural, the genitive plural, the dative plural, and the accusative plural. Those are all the different case endings, except for the vocative, that you will encounter in basically every paragraph that you ever read. You'll have these case endings. Each of them indicates a different meaning for that noun. This word agros, agru, agroi, agron, agroi, agron, agrois, agrus, it's all the same word, but every ending, every suffix, tells you that the word has a different function in the sentence. So take a look at these again. The first one, the nominative singular, that indicates that the word agros, which means field, is the subject of the sentence. Agru indicates a variety of things, the genitive singular, but for the most part the simplest meaning is that it is the possessive. Um, the best way to translate it is to put the word of before it. So instead of saying the field, this would say of the field. For example, those are the flowers of the field, or that is the dirt of the field. That belongs to the field, is what the second one indicates. If you use the word of to translate, agru, of the field, you'll always be right. The next one is the dative singular, and that um, is the indirect object. This one is similar. If you always translate it with the word to, 
or the word for, you'll be right. So, for example, this would say for the field. Agroi would mean something like I planted the flowers for the field, for the benefit of the field. Or I added the fertilizer for the field. Or you could say I give um, the flowers to the girl. That would be an example of the indirect object in the dative case. To or for is the dative. Of is for the genitive. And the nominative is very simple. It's the subject of the sentence. It's the thing that does the action. The last one, the accusative, is used to indicate the direct object. That's the thing that receives the action of the verb directly. The direct object is what the accusative case expresses, and that receives the action of the verb. In really simple sentences, you're usually going to have a nominative, a subject, and a direct object. The genitive and the dative are going to be a little less common in very basic sentences, but they'll be everywhere. And then the plural is just the same thing except in the plural. This is the subject of the sentence because it's the nominative. It's just plural instead of field. It's fields. This is the genitive, so it's of. Instead of of the field, it's of the fields. This is the dative, so it's to the fields or for the fields. And finally, the direct object is just fields. It receives the direct action of the verb. The dative is the indirect object. The accusative is the direct object, whether it's singular or plural. Those are the different suffixes that you add to the end of a noun. Those endings are called case endings. The names of the cases are nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and vocative. Again, I skipped over the vocative. And then finally, you have a singular or a plural case ending for each of those different suffixes. Just a quick note so you understand the general gist. The vocative case ending, which I kind of skipped, is used when you want to address someone directly. So, for example, the name Zeus, the god Zeus, looks like this if it's in the nominative. Uh, sorry, my Z is not a very Greek Z there. The name Zeus would be pronounced Zeus, and it looks like this in the nominative when it's the subject of a sentence. When you're speaking to Zeus directly as if he were a person, hey Zeus, how are you? It's spelled like this, Zeu. That's an example of the vocative. The vocative is somewhat common in Greek, it's just not a priority at this point in our lessons. So I want you to be aware that the vocative case ending exists for nouns, but I don't want to make it a priority. The next major point is that in Greek there is something called the definite article. In English, the definite article is the word the. In English, you do not add a suffix onto the. If you want to say the girl or the girls, the word the does not change. In English, however, sorry, in Greek, however, the word the adds endings just like the word girl. Just like the other nouns, the definite article gets endings put onto a stem. The definite article, in other words, behaves like a noun and actually behaves like a verb as well because both have stems that add endings to them. When you add the ending to a verb, it's called conjugation. When you add an ending to a noun or a definite article, it's called declension. Basically, the point is you add an ending to a stem. For a verb, it's called conjugation. For a noun, it's called declension. The definite article uh, to start out with, um, we'll just learn the word ho. That's the nominative singular for the. 
it goes through declensions just like any other word. This would mean of the, because it's the genitive singular. This would mean to or for the, because it's the dative singular. And this would mean the as the direct object of the verb, because it's the accusative. The same thing would happen for the plural. The definite article would decline. This is the for the plural subject. This is of the for the genitive plural. This is to or for the in the data plural, and this is the as the direct object. Probably all overwhelming and confusing. There's uh, a bit too much information to present at first, but be patient with it, take notes, ask questions, and then as the lessons progress, there'll be less new material to learn. It won't be so overwhelming. It's important to note at this point, too, that what you have learned for nouns in the definite article are only one variety of about three total, three major varieties. So nouns have a first category called the first declension. Now, uh, sorry, nouns also have a second declension, so-called. That's a type of noun. And nouns often also come in a variety that's called the third declension. These are vast categories with lots of subcategories. So far, you've only learned what the second declension looks like, and you haven't even learned all of the second declensions. You've just been given a taste of what the second type of noun looks like in Latin. Uh, sorry, Greek. Um, the definite article is somewhat similar in that the definite article comes in a masculine form, which you've seen the nominative and all the other case endings for. It comes in a feminine form, and it comes in a neuter form. So the definite article, the, ho, or the, hey, or the, to, is the nominative singular masculine, the nominative singular feminine, and the nominative singular neuter. Again, that's an enormous amount of information to um, process, but you have to just start with ho and be patient and trust me that the remaining information will come a little bit slower and it will make more sense as you kind of slow down. The reason I bring up the different types and the gender is because nouns have to agree with the definite article and vice versa. In other words, if you have a noun that is masculine, like agros, this is a nominative noun, this is singular, and it happens to be masculine. Every noun is given a gender, and it never changes that gender. Field, agros, is always masculine. It can change its case ending, and I can make this a genitive singular, but it will always be masculine. Agreement refers to the fact that if I put a definite article in front of this to say the field, ho agros, I have to change the gender, the case, the number, and the gender so that it agrees with agros. A noun's gender never changes. The definite article's gender can change. The case ending can change. For example, if I want to say of the field, I have to put the definite article in the genitive singular masculine so that it agrees with agru, which is also in the genitive singular masculine. If I put my noun in the accusative plural, and this one happens to be masculine, accusative plural masculine, I also have to pick the accusative plural definite article. Q 
choose the plural masculine. In other words, my point is that nouns and definite articles always are in agreement. In case, ending, nominative, genitive, dative, or accusative, number, singular or plural, and gender. A noun's gender never changes. The definite article's gender can change depending on which noun it is paired with. So look at some examples of some definite articles, the word the in English, and some nouns. This noun is a nominative, singular, masculine. I know that because it ends in OS. And eventually you'll memorize all the different endings. For now you don't know them by heart, but you will know them. It is a nominative singular, and it is permanently masculine. Therefore, I have to pick the nominative singular masculine definite article, which is ho. The word nike, on the other hand, happens to be nominative and singular, but it is feminine. It'll always be feminine. Its gender can never change because a noun's gender never changes. So because this is nominative singular and feminine, I need to choose hey. That is the word the, but it's nominative, singular, feminine. He nike means the victory. Ho agros means the field. Ho and he both mean the, but they have to have the same case ending, number, and gender as the noun they are paired with. So look at the next example. To dendron. Dendron is a neuter. It has no gender. Well, I shouldn't say that. It is neither gender is what neuter means. It is neither masculine nor feminine. It is called a, a neuter. English expresses no gender. Most or many other languages have masculine and feminine gender. Greek has neuter gender. They have three total genders. Todendron is a nominative. I know that because I've memorized the endings. It is singular. I know that because I've memorized the endings. And it is neuter. I always put these in the same order. Case, number, gender. And therefore, because that's nominative, singular, neuter, I have to choose to because that is also nominative, singular, neuter. Now look at dendru. It's a noun, so I can change the case endings. This example is genitive, singular, masculine. A noun's gender never changes. But this is genitive, singular, so this says of tree. If I want to say of the tree, I have to add the definite article, and I have to make it agree in case number and gender, genitive, singular, neuter, with the noun that it modifies or is paired with. Final example. This noun, nikase, is a genitive, singular, feminine. So, I have to pick the word the, the definite article, that's also genitive, singular, feminine. All of these things are things that you will eventually memorize. I don't expect you to memorize them now. You should not have any understanding of how to form these forms yet. You shouldn't understand how to make them. I'm just trying to explain the concepts so that we can go on in the next lesson to start practicing the formation of these words and start memorizing them. The basic point is that nouns and verbs and even the word the, the definite article, change their spelling and their pronunciation as they change their function in the sentence. When they're the subject, they're spelled one way. When they're possessive, they're spelled a different way, etc. No matter what their function is, direct object, indirect object, possession, or the subject, their spelling changes. Singular spelling changes versus plural spelling. Finally, a couple of tips for translation. When you translate, look for the verb to be at the end of the sentence. It will not be in English word order that you are used to. For example, you could have a sentence like this. Odikiopolis 
Athenaios Esten. All of these vocabulary words are easy enough to look up, but the word order is going to be strange. First of all, the Greeks used the word the in a weird way. Dikaiopolis is a name. This is a capital D. Dikaiopolis in Greek is referred to as the Dikaiopolis. Because his name is nominative, singular, and masculine, because he's the subject of the sentence, that's what the nominative indicates, because his name ends with an S, for example, I know, because I've memorized these forms, you haven't, but I know that this is nominative and singular, and I can always look it up in the dictionary and figure out that Dickopolis is a man. He happens to be masculine. So this is a nominative singular mascul uh, masculine noun, meaning it's the subject of the sentence. And therefore the word ho has to be used because it is also the nominative singular and masculine form. This sentence says, the Dickopolis Athenian an adjective, and then Estin means is. The Dikaiopolis Athenian is. Of course, in English, a good translation of that would say Dikaiopolis is an Athenian. The Greek does not have the word an. The verb comes at the end, and for some reason, they call everybody the, the Dikaiopolis, the Socrates. So there are some anomalies that you have to get used to when you're reading Greek. I'd say the first and most difficult one for most people is the verb is going to come at the end of many sentences. Not every sentence, but the verb is going to come at the end of many sentences. The other thing that's going to remain problematic a little bit in the beginning is understanding the use of the case endings. If you look at this example right here, ho kleros, Pareche, Siton. Now, in this example, I did not put the verb at the end of the sentence, just to prove to you that the verb doesn't have to come at the end of the sentence, but it often will. This one I put in mostly English word order. When you read this sentence, it's going to say the, there's your definite article farm. Pareje means it provides. It could also mean he provides or she provides, but in this case, kleros is clearly the subject and the nominative case ending. This is the nominative, so it agrees with kleros. The farm provides seton. When you try to look for seton in the dictionary, you're going to come across the word sitos. This may confuse you. But seton has the accusative case ending. In the dictionary, you always get the word in the nominative singular. So if you see sitos, that's going to be the nominative singular, and this happens to be masculine, whereas this form is the accusative singular masculine. So don't be confused by the case endings. The accusative means that it receives the action. The farm provides food. Ho kleros pareche siton. What does it provide? It provides the direct act object in the accusative. Ho kleros is the subject. It does the providing. And then you ask the question, what does it provide? That's answered by the accusative case ending. So it'll make it difficult and maybe confusing at first to look up words. But just remember that every noun and every verb changes its ending depending on the way it functions in the sentence. So if you see a word that has the right first three or four or five letters, it's the right word. You just have to think about how it's being used because its ending has changed. All right, I imagine that's way too much information for one half hour and one lesson, but it will situate you in Greek. If all of this goes over your head, that's fine. Take notes, watch it slowly, go back and rewind, and in three or four or five weeks, 
all of this information will be start to be integrated and you'll start to use it. So don't be frustrated with the overwhelming amount of jargon and information in this first screencast. It's a necessary way to situate you in the language so you have a way to move forward and you understand the basic fundamental terms and concepts. The essentials are that verbs, nouns, and even the word the, a definite article, add suffixes to the end of their stems to change their meaning. You can't memorize them yet, but I want you to know that there are suffixes, and that's the key to understanding Greek. Um, the definite article has to agree in case, number, and gender with the noun it modifies, and the translation at first will be very difficult to do. That's my daughter telling me that the screencast is over.